I don't know, I think I'm done, Richard. You've kind of covered things a little bit, but um, thank you for that introduction. Um, Richard has been an incredible supporter of SEER, and he's kind of a force to be reckoned with in the industry. SEER is forever grateful for Shepherd's support. Richard Anderson has been an ongoing helper as well. Provision of sample as well as financial support makes the research um, that we do possible, so thank you so much. It does, it's not lost on me that I'm on a stage that Doug Ducate used to stand on. This was one of his favorite events to present at. So never did I think that I'd be here in his stead and I would never try to replace um, Doug Ducate. He's a bit of a legend and an icon in our industry. But again, it's a real privilege to be here. Um, so moving on, got a lot of ground to cover. I pre-warn you, I've got more slides here and data than I'm gonna touch upon. I've intentionally created it that way. You can download this PDF document at a later time so that it becomes a resource for you for reference. If you wanna take it back to your offices for further brainstorming and the like, that was my intention. So, anybody know this picture? Anybody been, been to France lately? The thinker, le penseur, right? The thinker. That's why I love the sandbox concept, right? Now more than ever, it's so important for you to reflect hard about what you do, and Richard's absolutely right. How much change do you want to implement? Where's that line? I mean, the trade show industry is in part science and it's in part art, right? It's a very cool industry to be in. So you need to think hard. And to that end, I want to share data with you as you reflect in the next couple of days on how to transform or evolve what you do. So first let me share with you market level insights per the index. Um, here we've uh, estimated that the US gross domestic product contribution by the trade show industry is $80 billion in 2016. That's no chump change, right? It's a pretty big contribution. It's more than what the plastics and rubber industry has contributed to the US economy. In this past year, over 9,400 uh, trade shows took place. That shows it has at least 3,000 net square feet of paid space and at least 10 exhibitors. So if you cl included even smaller events, our industry is larger. So over 1.35 million companies exhibit at a show. And over 33 million business professionals go. It's a very vibrant industry, and I'll show you that, uh, that we're on a growth uh, track where it's a good time to be in the trade show industry. So if you look at this, in red is the index. We've um, tracked the performance of the industry since 2000. In blue is the performance of our economy. So if you're looking at how the industry overall is going to perform, look no further than the economy, right? It doesn't, it's not a perfect parallel uh, performance, but it's pretty darn close. So that's a basic element uh, to keep in mind when you're thinking of planning. But just as in any economy, some se sectors do better than others, right? We tracked 14 sectors. So the bars in blue were the winners in 2016, food and construction in particular. Finally, discretionary uh, income has gone up for people. People have got more money to spend. They go out to eat more, go to specialty food stores and the like. Food's doing well. Finally, the inventory of housing, that glut of housing due to the economic collapse has dried up, starting to stimulate new construction in uh, residential housing. Even millennials are gonna start jumping into the games. So housing, construction, poised to grow. Now those sad looking red lines or bars on the other side of the equation, not such a happy time. Raw materials, the culprit of this tremendous decline in 2016 was the price of a barrel of oil. In February, $28 a barrel, far below the historic highs of over $90 a barrel. What happened? Production slowed, exploration halted, fewer attendees to those shows in the sector. 
Now, looking forward, raw materials is expected to stabilize. It won't be necessarily doing that well. Government um, and education is going to be slower growing, but all the other sectors looks good for 2017. So growth is the word. Looking forward at the forecast horizon for 2017 and looking two years out. <clears throat> um, barring any, I like to call black swans. We've had a lot of black swans these days, don't you think? What's a black swan? My goodness. North Korea, now I, heard, I just read Russia's threatening uh, because of the bombing in Syria. We've got a presidency that's under threat. Nothing to date is derailing the econ economic growth forecasts. Even before Trump stepped into the White House, the forecasts were positive. It's just a natural upswing uh, relating to the recovery of 2008. So to date, and in the first quarter of this year, uh, the industry, our trade show industry, um, had a positive gain of 1.6. So if everything goes to forecast, our uh, industry will um, grow at about a clip of 2.3%. Uh, 2.4, my, uh, my apologies, just under gross domestic product, which is 2.5. Then it's going to go up to 2.8 and actually surpass the forecast for gross domestic product in 2019. So depending upon where your show is, look to the sector performance for your planning. Is it going to be a cash-rich year, or do you have to tighten your belts? Look to our forecast on a sector basis. Um, also, I haven't pointed this out in the slides, but we now have something called the event calculator. Go to it, set up an account, key in the results for your event, and you will see the performance of your event against the index results. That's a nice tool to integrate into your business planning. If you're outperforming uh, your sector, great bragging rights to your board of directors or whomever. So start playing with our event Analyzer. All you need to do is log in. It's free. Okay, so moving on. Why is it that the trade show industry is so strong? Why is it so robust? Digital gives marketers so many different ways to market and sell their products, but we endure. What is it about face-to-face -face marketing that is so compelling? Here I'm, I'm going to go a little offline and share a story from when I was in law school. Our property law professor talked about an ancient ceremony called Fiofman Livery of Season. You don't have to remember that term, but it talks about this handshake thing. Basically, it was a ceremony that transferred property rights from one person to another. This is like feudal times. So when somebody was trading property, they'd go out to the plot of land, they'd pick up some of the soil, and they'd shake hands with the soil between. And with that was a transfer of property rights. Think about that. The art of the deal today, that handshake. Moving fast forward to research we've done in 2012, asking attendees, what is it about attending a trade show that's unique? And I had to pour over a thousand comments. One theme that came out was a chance to shake hands, look at somebody eye to eye, face to face, and others explain. And in that moment, you can see is this person credible? Are they honest? Are they passionate about what they're selling? Is this an organization I want to do business with? It's based on that, that touch, that feel, that face-to-face -face interaction. When important business decisions have to be made, face-to-face -face is important. So from an attendee's perspective, why do they go to a given trade show? How can you turn an attendee to a repeat attendee? We did the attendee retention study last year. And these are the factors that drive repeat attendance to a specific event. They come to shop, and they come to learn. They, most attendees come with dual agendas. And it's interesting because the results here mirror why attendees go to a show in general. But obviously, these, repeat, uh, these attendees um, find that the event they go to repeatedly meet their business needs, right? So number one, and this is an, a longstanding motivation, it's to see new product technology. Right? We'll see what's new, what's hot, the new product introductions. New introductions might not roll out at a show, but they want to see it. They want to touch, feel, interact with the products that are happening, talk to the people behind the products, and brainstorm. From a learning perspective, 
It's all about new and hot again. What are those hot industry trends? And as well, professional networking is a very important way to learn. How many of you have had, already had learnings? This isn't a trade show, but it's the same thing. There's face-to-face, peer-to-peer, peer-to-professional um, expert and the like. The learnings happen, right? Right next to each other, right? There's something learn that happens, a multi-directional power of a face-to-face -face, um, event that has profound learnings for professional communities. That's why over 33 million business professionals you know, leave to sharpen their skills, learn new things, to become those experts, the rock stars back at their companies, to give their companies competitive advantage. Learning comes in addition to seminars and the like that are offered through the interactions with people that attend. Why do exhibitors spend so much? I mean, for those companies that exhibit, trade show spending tends to be the larger percentage of their, um, their budgets. Why do they invest in our channel? It's not for fun. It's because it delivers results. I know we struggle. Oh, well, we don't have a precise ROI measure, blah, blah, blah. Something's happening there. And what we see in the past two years, we've done research on what are the top-ranked important objectives. The same three bubble up. Sales lead generation, um, branding efforts, and relationship management. Now, sales lead generation or relationship management makes complete sense to me. But I'm confounded that branding efforts remain a top-ranked important objective. What does that signal to all of us? Digital can't do it all, right? Face-to-face -face marketing penetrates the noise. When you as an organizer bring your community under one roof, right? If you have these words in the commentaries about what you like about the show in particular, if they say, oh, it brings the media, our industry together all under one roof, you've got a golden event. That's what you want to hear in your open-ended commentary. And that provides a powerful branding experience marketing opportunity for the exhibitors that are in there because they want to penetrate the noise, oops, penetrate the noise um, of, of all that digital stuff. And the reason why it's so powerful is the more engaged an attendee is in an exhibit booth, it's documented through research, and if anybody wants to, I can point you to that data, shows that it has a positive impact on key performance indicators that the C-suite cares about. Net promoter score, brand awareness, brand fit, intent to purchase. That's what I'm talking about, right? Depends on your exhibiting company and who, what they want to achieve. And not everybody wants to change, achieve the same thing. But pay attention. Make sure that your events are delivering to these ends. But it's a powerful branding experience. So here's where the rubber hits the road as it relates to, to the purchase process continuum. There's eight stages listed here. Exhibitors are asked, when is it important to interact with targets in their booth? <clears throat> All pre-purchase stages and post-purchase to maintain relationships. If I would overlay the attendee results in terms of when it's important to them to interact with exhibitors, same pattern. All pre-purchase stages post-purchase to maintain relationships with their suppliers. Now, I've heard some things saying, oh, a lot more people are doing things independently. They don't want to engage with people, blah, blah, blah. I'm not convinced this is new. When we did research in 2012, 55% of the attendees said, we like to, I like to walk the show floor. I don't want to talk to anybody until I'm ready. So the exhibitors need to know, you know time to engage when the attendee's ready. Right? Do you, I mean, it's impossible if there's a 500 booth show, you're not going to talk to every booth, booth staffer in every booth. You're going to look around and see what's of relevance. So that gives you a snapshot why attendees go to a show repeatedly and in general um, insights as it relates to why companies exhibit. Now, I'm going to share with you some top line results from our most recent research. This is where the rubber hits the road in relation to engagement, right? We're all struggling with that word. Why is engagement? Um, I offer you this construct or framework for you to think hard about as you look to evolve your show floors. 
Our research reveals that these three elements are essential to keep in place to, main, uh, to satisfy the base level needs of what attendees are looking to experience. They're looking for people to people engagement, people to product engagement, and education. I already talked to you about that whole educational concept. I'm not talking to you about how you're gonna evolve things. That's for you, the magic makers, to figure out. But as you look to evolve things, and as Richard said, there's a line, I don't know what it is, inventory it against these three pillars. If you throw these things out, if you get some really cool experiential AV thing and nobody's on the floor, the exhibitor side of the equation, and in engage meaningfully with your attendees, you've lost your show. And it's not that they're gonna go just online and put their Oculus thing on and hang out in their offices. They're gonna go to another event that maintains and delivers the face-to-face -face elements of their shows. So think about these three pillars. So here's a snapshot of people-to-people -people engagement. This is today, and these are the most popular people-to-people uh, -people networking activities you as organizers can make available outside of exhibit booths. So, the dark green signifies uh, organizers that offer an activity. Light green are exhibitors that have sponsored a given activity. And the lines to look at are at the top. Uh, the percentage of these organizers and exhibitors that say a given activity enjoys high attendee use. So in this study, the measure is the highest engagement is where high attendee use is found. So I'm looking for the lines where there's consensus between as much as possible between organizers and exhibitors. So as it relates to networking, which one do you think would be the best bang for the buck and offer the best engagement opportunity? Any guesses out there? Sorry? You win. Do you want one of these um, headsets? Oh, no. Yes, receptions. Whether they're during the show hour or after the show hours, they enjoy high attendee engagement gives you all a sponsorship revenue stream, gives the exhibitors a chance to inject their staff into that activity. And um, attendees want to engage with uh, booth staff. That's a very big motivation for repeat attendance. So if you have to prioritize what you do, look to the receptions. The other uh, res um, activities really speak to branding opportunities from a sponsorship perspective. Whether you've got room and you can have food service on the show floor or some kind of lounge where attendees can relax. So lounges can be as souped up and high cost fancy as you want or bare bones. Just having tables and chairs will do the job, particularly for a medium sized to a larger event, right? Attendees get tired, they need to sit. We can have nice couches or you can have some funky cool digital thing to add a cool factor to it or some kind of other activity here asking attendees to mark where they're coming from. That becomes a conversation starter. There's an automotive engineering show that I interviewed the gentleman and he said they have an amazingly cool lounge. Uh, they have multiplex uh, screens where you can watch ESPN, you can watch the news, you can get your shoes shine, and the like. So it's, it signals this, create lounges that reflect your community, the culture, and the personality of your community. Or maybe you want to think outside of the box. How many of you have heard of C2? One, two, several of you. It's not a trade show. It's a convening of CMOs and CEOs that get together to brainstorm on business challenges. And one of the board of directors is from Cirque du Soleil. So you know they're going to push the boundaries of reality, right? So here you've got, this was done a couple years ago where they lift people in chairs. I don't know what the liability issues are to having some. <laughs> but um, it was so popular that in 2017, they've got it even more ramped up. They have a group of what? We have like four or five groups of five people uh, being suspended in air having conversations. So a fun way to engage. How many of you have actually gone into ball pits when you were kids? Anybody? Anybody? Okay, so we got some of the younger folks. I, I've been in the ball pits with my son. They're a lot of fun, right? So here's C2, they had brainstorming in a ball pit. If you do something like this, make sure to have lockers because people might lose their, lose their phones or keys and that sort of thing. But anyway, think outside the box of how to facilitate engagement face-to-face -face outside of the norm. Use art. Either you have an artist, 
here at this particular event was doing graphical depictions of, of what was happening on the show floor. It creates a social media experience opportunity. Or why not let people, the attendees, go into um, places where there are coloring walls? That's like a real in thing now, right? You see coloring walls and people like to draw, right? It's a nice way to de-stress. Or why not take the product that's being showcased and create it as part of an, a, an area? So here at a food show, food is art. What if it's a bicycling show? Bike parts is art. I don't know, the sky's the limit. Um, how can you make it reflect your community? Um, have some fun with it. Go to museums and see the various spaces that they use for that engagement to really you know, ramp up um, the feel and look of the experiences that you deliver at your shows. Here, I, mean, I'm this, I imagine this is a higher cost one, but this event took place in Spain. They actually replicated the town square on the show floor for their reception area. Very beautiful, so um, different ideas to think about. Now, this is at the Perioperative Nursing Association, high rate of women. Women tend to like champagne, me included. A nice, elegant way to get a glass of champagne. All right, so the second pillar, people to product um, experiences. So we have a whole bunch here. It falls into new product categories, product demonstration areas, and pavilions. So if you're going to start somewhere, if you only have so much uh, room and money, I would recommend doing some kind of uh, product demonstration area, whether that's a stage where exhibitors can showcase their products, but better yet, give attendees a chance to test drive the products themselves. Number two, some kind of pavilion, a, a pavilion that um, showcases a given product category, something new, something hot. Diving Equipment Manufacturers Association, had a, a, a product pavilion on paddle boards when they were new. And that area was just pummeled with attendees. Very, very popular. Now, the one conundrum I see here is this gap in perception of high attendee use on new product showcases. And it comes up on the attendee research that we've done, too. Exhibitors that have participated, 61% of exhibitors say the new product showcase enjoys high attendee use. And only 52% of the organizers say that it enjoys high use. What's going on? Now, with the attendee research that we did, 75% of repeat attendees say it's a big reason why they go back to a show repeatedly. Only 48% of organizers said it was important. So is it that you're looking for volume? And if you're doing some kind of mapping of volume or whatever, I think you should be looking as to who which attendees go to that booth? Because there's traction there. Is it the specifiers? Is it the buyers that are going in? Because there's engagement happening, valuable engagement. If you're a medium to larger size event, please have a new product showcase. It's a way that helps attendees to organize their visit. And something's going on here. And um, I don't know, something to reflect on. To, um, Scott, I, I see you're, you're nodding your head. You're agreeing, okay. I shouldn't wait. I shouldn't wake you up because I know you're going to get feisty on me. All right. Um, so new product showcases can take different shapes and forms, right? Here is the SEMA, the automotive aftermarket, and they have a new product showcase. The product is behind a glass case. That's not my favorite thing. I like people to have access to the product itself. But what's cool is they've got the SKU lines, so they can scan that information for reference later. And the great thing is, and I mean, SEMA is a big show. It's like 17 to 20,000 attendees walking that floor. The new product showcase is online. What a great motivation to get the word out, right? Promote your products. So your, your show is promoting new products, innovations. And it, what's a big driver of attending a show? Seeing what's new, what's hot. It feeds everything, right? <clears throat> now, Kimberly, I'm going to move on to the next example. This is one of your clients, SuperZoo. Look at that. This is a new product showcase, and the, are they showcasing only the winners, or is it all new products, Kimberly, that are out there on that? Uh, all new products. All new products. It's not fancy. It's just tables. They've slapped out the products. Look how busy it is. It does the job. You don't have to overthink it. People want to touch, feel, experience a product. This does the job.
Some um, organizers even allow staff to be present to answer questions on the spot. Attendees want to get, they come to a show to have those deep dive discussions. You can find a lot of information online. But when they come, they want to dive deeper and get better sense of, the, uh, of, of a product and ask questions. So any opportunities to connect product experts with the people uh, or attendees most probably would be well received. World of Concrete, this is one of my favorite ones. It's a fantasy of mine to um, use a jackhammer to rip up cement. I'd most probably hurt myself, but what a great way to test drive products, right? And DEMA invests in a pool so that folks or diving instructors that go, go in and test drive the product. It does take a little effort to recruit, to get people to go into uh, to a wetsuit and go into that water, but they do it, it's successful, creates experience for everybody, those watching and, and those in the pool. Food shows are easy, right? Just get a famous chef, do the product demos. You've got the American Library Association promoting uh, the latest cookbooks. And I just want emphasis added on new product competitions. I used to manage uh, market research at Diversified Communications. They had the, one of the largest seafood shows, well, the largest seafood show in the world, it was Seafood Process Europe. And seafood, pro well, and it showcased seafood and product packaging folks. And they weren't happy with the extent of innovation in the industry, so they intentionally created a new product innovation competition to stimulate innovation, right? And this is like a highly coveted competition. You get bragging rights for your sales cycle in the coming year. Diversified has publications so that they could broadcast out. It's of global reach. Um, the seafood industry globally reads it. And now they've changed the name to uh, Seafood Excellence, and now they tout that they're the most, the largest trade show in the world by calling it Seafood Global and Expo. So you can be the engines for innovation. You really need to maximize that, right? That's really important to do because you're, if you're the meeting place for your industries, you should be touting that. So other ways to do product demos, why not have a social media experience opportunity? Here, social media bloggers uh, basically went to product demos and each booth so they would hear a pitch and then they would blog and social media uh, deploy their commentary out based on what they experienced. Are you giving new product, no, new startup companies a place to participate or get a, a test, a, a read? on the industry. So here it's the solar industry. Eureka Park is known for Consumer Electronics Show. Innovative Food, they have test kitchen concept ideas. Then they have um, another area for smaller companies that are market ready and the like. How are you driving innovation in your industries? Again, if you're a medium to large size show, it's daunting to go to a show at first. Do you offer tours? This is nothing new, but it's very much appreciated for first timers international buyers. So that summarizes um, the second pillar. Let's now quickly go on to education. Um, offering education on an exhibition floor, its influence on generating repeat attendance is more influential the smaller the floor size. Okay, Where it's a very large show, the show itself is, is the draw. But for smaller shows, if you're going to put education on a show floor, what do you think is the best option here, looking quickly at this data? One just like spikes up. Sorry? I heard workshops. Okay, you're the next person who gets a headset, whoever said that. Yeah, the more interactive, the better. I mean, just goes, it's way beyond anything else. Do engagement. You can do a lot with that, right? Some kind of workshop interactivity for training, um, depending on your professional community, there's always some kind of training need. Um, then you see three that are somewhat similar in terms of engagement. If you're going to do some kind of short format, professional development topics, industry trends, hot trends, people are going to put up with a longer uh, presentation, 45 minutes is okay, or presented, presenter facilitated. Discussions, so it's about the formats. So hands-on, doesn't have to be fancy, but it's something to help satisfy their educational needs. And you, as the organizers, can control the setting that can help facilitate that interactivity. 
And I don't know how you'd use this, but I wanted to throw it in. I'm seeing Legos everywhere. Seeing Legos everywhere? Legoland is permeating. It's a fun mechanism for here. It's for some kind of team building exercise. They're doing uh, urban planning, and they're using Legos. Even the bot guy. Where's that bot guy? Kind of looks like a Lego thing to me. Uh, Shepherd bot. So your exhibitors. Do you offer training? Only about 30% of uh, organizers do. I know you're frustrated because you put in all this time and they don't use it, right? 79% uh, of exhibitors do their training internally. So if you're going to do some kind of training, offer a menu of options that could be integrated into their training that can be downloaded when they're ready to do it. It's hard. It's hard. You guys are trying. I know you're trying. Um, but it's worth the effort because what the engagement experience is in those booths can make or break the survival and growth of your show. So I'm going to touch briefly on the, 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 the elements here of people and product. Education comes through those product demonstrations. To a lesser extent, exhibitors do education. But when it comes to people-to-people -to -people engagement, it's all about the right staff in the booth, right? And if all you have are booth babes and nobody to back up, not good. I mean, somebody always does something like that and kind of creates a buzz on the show. But you need to make sure there's credible, knowledgeable staff in the background to have those meaningful engagements when the attendee's ready to have it. If there's no booth staff and you have a lot of those, that's not good. People stay home. You don't leave an office. You don't jump a plane to go to an empty booth. Make sure your exhibitors are stepping up. So sales and marketing are typically there, and they enjoy high engagement. But the second category of, of um, staffers is what I find most interesting. It's not the executives that enjoy high attendee engagement. It's the product technical experts. For example, like a software show, the rock stars in those booths are the product developers. People want to engage. They want to drive deep. They want to know what's going on with a product, they might want to advocate for enhancements or new product ideas and the like. People want to have those meaningful discussions. When it comes to product engagement, so important to have the product in the booth. Product in the booth. Now, of course, if it's services, it's the people, and there'll be some kind of digital element maybe to explain and do the overview. But where it's a product, they should have some representation of booth. And that gets hard, right? The more expensive drayage material handling gets. You need to make the effort. That's why attendees come out. Hats off to Con Expo, Con Ag. Every three years they do that show. They have serious capital equipment on the floor. They even like did some kind of 3D printing of an excavator, and they assembled it and uh, showcased it working. So they're coming for that face-to-face -face experience. Booth scanners, very important for that product uh, follow-up with attendees. And they're using the scanners to measure the outcome um, of, of e exhibiting. This is becoming more pronounced in terms of looking at whether the show is good or not. Other engagement tactics, the uh, long-standing things, samples, giveaways, that's important to continue, and then raffle prize drawings. Other tactics... Um, I think the challenge for all of us is how to gamify things, not just for whimsy, but to educate attendees in a fun way. I don't know if it has, every booth has to be a game, but we need to think hard about this. Because, and younger folks in the room, if there's some kind of competition or gamification, is that something that you might be attracted to, to engage with the content in the booth? Would you? Anybody? Don't know? Think about it. 7% of uh, exhibitors use gamification, and look how high the engagement is, 67%. High attendee engagement. I know vendors are coming online that offer easy ways to create games. It's hard. I, personally, it's hard for me. But I, I think that's a challenge for us to try to get things to be engaging. So digital's role in this mix I always I get emphasis added, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Don't throw away the face-to-face -face element of, of your events because attendees want access to that. They want that experience. The tremendous opportunities that are made available by digital 
is hitting that easy button. Easy ways to find the content, the people, the product, and whatever else they're looking for, coupons, whatever. Um, it inevitably enhances the value of the experience. That's the challenge, and we're not done with it. It is hard work. You as organizers are trying. You're trying. We know from another study, a digital toolkit study, that um, exhibitors are using digital in their booths, but the results from this more current study suggest they're doing it independently of you. They're not integrating necessarily. From these results here, only three uh, digital tactics are used to facilitate attendee engagement. Emails, social media, uh, requests for meetings. Everything else is used by fewer than 20% of exhibitors. So if you look to the other side um, oh, here, digital tactics enjoying high attendee use, among those um, minority of exhibitors, a majority of them say, yeah, these tactics are enjoying a high attendee use. So those are your lead learners. You need to chat with them. If you find that you have a tribe of those lead learners using digital tactics, understand why they say it's enjoying attendee use, how it gives them benefits, and from that you can help coach your other exhibitors um, or maybe ramp up or enhance what you're doing to do even better. But, you know, the mobile app thing drives me nuts. Does mobile apps, do that drive you nuts in terms of uh, the percentage of attendees that download it? Are you hitting your heads against the wall? Are you? I don't understand why people don't do it, but that real estate on a phone is very precious. About 20% of attendees won't ever download it because they don't want to download something for a one-time use. It might be that you need to do the show mobile app and you need to do a printer program, might need to do something else. I don't know. We remain in transformative times. Um, I don't know. Keep on trying. You have to keep trying. There are, yes. Eighty percent will use a show mobile app, but the question then is, is are, do you have the mobile app to the website linked together, or can you bypass the mobile app completely? There's a lot of different solutions out there. Are any of you using that? Yeah? Well, uh, let's say my show has 89 percent uh, acquisition mobile app. Downloads. Yes. And I think for two reasons. One is we tote the heck out of it at the show. Every presenter is mentioning it up on the stage. All You're round. You, you've got to have more than three days worth of stuff. So you have content. What do you provide year round to keep? Job board, publications, uh, any, any other events that you're doing, include them there. Mm -hmm. Did you know your, some of your exhibitors? I know some of the big players in medical, for instance, they have their own show mobile app. They're bypassing you. Why wouldn't they? If I'm doing 100 to 200 shows, I'm going to have my own mobile app. How is your data? Is it in a fashion, do you give real-time access to your exhibitors or your attendees to engage with each other? You might be the barrier. And they're going to find ways around you if you don't figure it out. I mean, there's a bit of a race in play. Some are going to work around you just because they can't help themselves. They're rebellious and they're going to do that. But um, there's a lot of different technologies, but that's great. So in essence, a solution, if you're going to get your mobile app to be relevant, it needs to have content regularly refreshed, um, pertinent. I mean, I'm a weather geek on top of being a data geek. I'm always like, what's the weather? What's the weather? I look at all these different things. So you need to give content that they're going to drill down on, and then it might become a staple um, for their own consumption. So here's some examples for that engagement, so real-time access. I know when... Um, a very large medical company, they're frustrated with shows. They're like, sometimes all we can see is a badge. We don't even have access to the data and, and all these things. And they might not even get the data. It might not ever come back clean. Yee. Major investment in a show, you never even get a quality data back. Yikes. Why would you do that? Got to, like, ramp up your game on, on the data. And I know there's fear about overwhelming attendees, but you need to experiment. I don't have the, I, that line thing again. What is it? I don't know. But it's an area that requires experimentation. So you stay ahead of um, this need or interest. So here's an example of geomessaging using iBeacon. So the American Library Association, their regional event, they gave 15 exhibitors a chance to put beacons in their exhibit things. 
um, attendees that download the, the Blue Beam app have access to the exhibitor information as well as all the event content. So participating exhibitors could put their logo, point attendees to the website. They could show, uh, use show coupons to do show specials and the like. One example, I don't have the results of that experiment yet. And I just put this in here, and I know at ECEF I was not there, and maybe Kimberly can talk about it later, but this whole geofencing thing, it's not new, but it's coming, it's coming into our worlds. Um, one of the uh, companies that I interviewed for the attendee engagement study said that they use Solomo Technology, which is a geofencing provider. So they're able to track booth movement through this. They're not using you. So if you're not, you're holding back your RFID and stuff. The technology is tremendous through phone technology. I don't know enough here. I'm pointing this out. You need to keep, to keep checking it out. I know Solomo Technology, some of their clients are SEMA, Consumer Electronics Show, I see Harley Davidson as well, that they're promoting. And they've got another name of another um, tool that they have available. But I mean, there's just constant inf innovation. You've got to keep pace. C2 again, Montreal. Instead of worrying about all your phones and the connectivity, is the GPS, are they opting in, blah, 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 blah. They're like, forget about that. Let's have badges that can do it all. So here, through their badges, they're able to make brain dates, sign up for conference sessions, even buy a drink. And uh, you can pull this down. Uh, the name of the vendor is, um, it's a click platform. And it's PixMob, I believe. Anybody know PixMob? So I mean, it's crazy, isn't it? There's always a new player coming out. Um, yeah, Montreal. I did not use it. This is Montreal C2. They have keep a watch. Go Google this. They they'll end up having like a, a hundred page document that documents the outcome of all of their experiments. I mean, they're very avant garde. But you really, I mean, you gotta go to the edge here, people. Go to the edge. Don't look to the norm if you want to evolve. Some of it's gonna be absolutely silly, and you're like, no, I can't put this in. But something might trigger an idea. I mean, in a research concept, it's force-fitting. I remember many years ago, I did a focus group on uh, self-serve registers at, um, um, at supermarkets back when they didn't exist. So in doing that discussion, I'm like, okay, well, you get gas, self-serve. How about you know getting your groceries and you know getting uh, used to a new concept? So look beyond. And so here, look to retail, right? Omnichannel marketing. The big the big uh, guys they're still struggling. You know, only about four to seven percent of the big brands are effectively using omnichannel marketing. Data silos, making sure that they have the data in the format to be able to make the right offer on the right device or. Everybody's struggling with this stuff, but look to retail to see what takes hold. You know, I always think you know if you're experimenting, it's like spaghetti. You throw it against the wall. What sticks? Look to retail. Let them be your lead learners. So, here is an example. Sorry, I'm French and I talk with my hands. So, personal experience. This is my new border collie, Moxie. She's 10 weeks old. She's wreaking havoc in the household. We love her, though. I went to PetSmart and bought her, her puppy food. Two days later, email from PetSmart. Congratulations on your new puppy. Do you see the dot? It's like at the beginning of what's apparently going to be a long-standing conversation, right? And, but it's chock full of coupons. I'm going to use that email. So you know, women in particular, pre-planning, over 80% pre-plan, women love to hunt for show special bargains. Are you giving them value, opportunity? Cartwheel, does anybody have Target? I call it Target. Do you use Cartwheel? Do you like it? You don't like it? I know, because you know, if you, don't, if you have a Target in your community, download the app, experience it. Because that's a, a customer loyalty mechanism, and you've got to scan the, the the uh, the skews, I get mad though when I don't get enough bargains on it. Yeah, 
I only, sh I only like saved two dollars last time. But anyway, um, these are mechanisms for creating the uh, enhancing value. So last thing before I sign off is this. Is there an appetite, is there an openness on the part of organizers and exhibitors to experiment with new ways of engaging? Results here suggest around a half say, yeah, we're interested, but I don't think they know what it is. You can't visualize it. I guess this is the Steve Jobs scenario, right? People don't know what it is until they see it. But you might have an audience among your exhibitors and your attendees that might want to brainstorm with you on ramping up your exhibition floor. So doing something other than the old-fashioned pipe and drape, um, and to a lesser extent, something that's smaller, more personalized. So that wraps up everything I could cover. I have even more data, but I'd drive you crazy. But just to sum up, our industry is alive and well and poised to grow. Um, as you look to evolve, Make sure you hold on to those face-to-face -face elements. Use those three pillars to um, make sure that you're not going too far, you're not crossing the line of what's critical to deliver face-to-face -face, uh, on, on your show floor. And um, have fun experimenting with digital and new formats. Um, it's a great time to be in our industry. So thank you for your time. It's open for questions. so that we could do the, the, um, event you know, analyzer. the event analyzer. Okay. Do you have to be a member or pay no. or anything that is a no. complimentary? What you need to do is log in, though, to save the data. It's worth your while. Otherwise, we only give you, like, five charts. If you log in, you get everything. So in order to get it, I mean, what you key in your data, I mean, what we have is you can use Snippet or whatever device you can to take the charts that you want to pull down. So it's, it's, a, it's free. We're not for profit organization. We welcome your contributions to continue things. But to, to pull it down, just use like Snippet or something, uh, the, the, the graphs. If you have any questions, email me. I'll help you out. Yes, I have a, question. I have a couple questions for you. First of all, um, is all of your research and data, is it North America focused or is it global? It is North American focused. Okay. And some of it, yeah, go ahead. Do you have a uh, counterpart overseas, particularly in Europe and or China? There are not really. There's some folks that do research a little bit, but not to the extent. There's really nothing that compares to the breadth of research we do. I know UFI is doing a little bit, but it's very, very uh, surface level. And I don't really pay attention as much to China, but there are, I, I don't believe. We have some of our documents that have been translated into Chinese, um, but. I, I understand the markets aren't as mature in terms of the exhibition industry, so that makes sense. But I was particularly curious about Europe. Um, so you mentioned there's possible counterpart in Europe? Well, UFI, UFI. UFI, okay. UFI, they've got a few okay, things, great. but it's, they don't have anything like the research I've just shared with you. Wonderful, I'll check that out. And then my next question is, um, through SEER, is there um, access and availability to market studies? So if you're interested in a resource, particularly for your own purposes of your own um, exhibitions group, um, is there a source? Well, the, thank you. The index gives you market level data. So in addition to the overall outlook of the industry, we have 14 um, sub-reports. It's all in the index. You would purchase the entire document. And it provides uh, the macro economic factors that influence each of the 14 sectors. Great. And then resources as well. Well, it mentions like the government sources and the like that drive performance that are used in the models. Wonderful, thank you so much. You're welcome. Going back to the awards program uh, stuff that you were talking about, we've kicked around the idea before with us, but there's, there's worry about how do we play fair, and meaning how do we keep it as flat line as possible? Any, any Tips, ideas. Which industry? Uh, theater. 
<laughs> well, I don't know. Lighting and technology, that kind of stuff. Okay. I don't know. I mean, can it be a jury-based voting? Some uh, judges that would be highly respected? There, there's, there's concern that if we put our name on an award that we have said to the industry that we believe this is the best one out there. Why not have a People's Award then? Like a People's Choice sort of yeah. thing? Yeah. Okay. Start with that. I mean, if they can't convince the audience, I don't know if it's... Any other ideas out there on how to speak to his concerns? People's choice. Any other questions? Julie, as an exhibitor, do you have any questions? Nancy, thank you. Okay.